this one hour is to give you a feel for uh, what virtual labs are, why we need to look at it, and uh, how do we use it productively in, a, in the teaching learning process. And since the focus of the session is also on content creation, I will take you uh, towards how would one go about building such labs if one, uh, one wants to do um, something like that. What, what can we do about it? So that's the final part of that. So I'll, in, in, along the way, I will give you a demo of uh, the virtual lab system that we have today, and also a tool that you can use to build virtual labs. Okay, so there is uh, you know any, any questions along the way, you can use the chat, uh, chat box and uh, keep uh, writing your questions. Once in a while, I'll kind of check it there, and at the end of the um, session, I will answer whatever questions are there on uh, on the chat box. Okay, so uh, with with that, uh, Kavit, let me start um, uh, the uh, the session per se. Um, so I, I hope you can see the screen. It says virtual labs concept to usage. Okay, and um, so as of now, we have about um, two hundred odd uh, virtual labs covering science, maths, English, and etc. For the uh, classes six to 12, but mostly the higher classes, classes nine to 12. These are currently available on the portal, collabs.edu.in or the diksha.go.in virtual labs portal. Okay, so in Diksha, these are also integrated into the content. So you read a lesson and then you can go to the lab and access the lab. So that so both these channels are open. You can access these labs and do. And I, I'm I'm pretty sure that you many of you might have tried these labs because during the pandemic when the schools were closed, we were actually using these labs to conduct the uh, lab sessions in in the in the higher classes. Right now, uh, with the uh, excitement of what what uh, these uh, turned out, how useful these turned out to be in the pandemic. Uh, the ministry is actually looking at building a bigger depository of virtual labs. So another uh, about 600 more labs can be expected to be there on the portal over the next couple of years. Okay, so that's a very, very um, wide, very uh, excellent repository of uh, student-centric activities, which you can use in your classroom and also to augment the, um, uh, the learning that happens there, right? So. The, the little screenshot that you see here on the, um, on the um, bottom right is um, the landing page of the um, OLABS portal, the olabs.edu.in. You can go to the website and access this portal right away. And um, the, as I mentioned, physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, and, um, and uh, English are the subjects which we are currently covering. But as, we, as I speak, a uh, lot of labs are getting added to this portal and uh, you know like month on month you will see a lot more growth in the on those portal in terms of the labs so um, as i mentioned this is the landing page of uh, all labs and you, you get a feel of what do we mean by virtual labs from there because it is not just the simulation that we are talking about there's a lot of um, detail that has been worked out so that as a teacher and as a student, you are comfortable performing the activity that is expected. So we also have a training program that we conduct. So if you want to register for a training or you want to request a training, that's a link which you can use it and tell us about it. There are also feedback links at the bottom of the page, which you can use to tell us what, um, uh, you know, any specific comments that you have. Okay. So I will come back to uh, some of these and also will show you a demo of these uh, as, as I go along. Okay, so on the uh, Diksha portal, this is how you will access the virtual labs. So there are again grade 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, etc. Many of them might be currently empty. We are in the process of uh, filling up uh, those labs. But if you go to a particular grade, let's say in this case, the grade 11, then click explore, you get the list of mediums available. You click the medium, you get the list of subjects available for that grade, and then you get the list of uh, labs, and then you can select to perform that particular activity. Okay, so both these channels are open to you, and do, do, do explore and tell us uh, what you liked and what you didn't, so we can build on it. Now, coming back to uh, labs in education or virtual labs per se, uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with uh, this and uh, they want also understand the need and relevance of these in a, in a, in a learning process right 
So laboratories are recognized as important devices in the learning process. Why? Because uh, you learn a lot of theory um, in the in the classroom, but you don't necessarily know how to, how that connects to practice in, in reality. So I can talk about you know uh, reflection and refraction and all that in uh, in a class or you know lens. But what does it mean in terms of you know uh, uh, connecting to the focal length or when you say burning of magnesium, what does it actually feel like or look like? So you don't get a feel of the lessons that is learned. And by going to the lab, performing these activities, you can kind of connect up that pieces. So connecting the theory to the real life is one primary objective of doing um, laboratory activities. So you go to the field and you know pick up, uh, observe uh, how uh, various insects or various uh, biological things actually you know uh, live in that environment. You learn the theory that and connect with, connected to the class. We also want to build the ability of building or conducting an experiment. And as you know, one of the key paradigms in science is experiment. So when I want to, when I suspect that something is, uh, you know, the case that this is caused by uh, this, uh, you, I want to encourage the student and say, okay, now how do we establish that it is actually so, or it is actually not so? So you create an experiment and uh, now an experiment typically would have a hypothesis. I'm, I'm setting up this experiment to validate or to understand whether this hypothesis is true. So experiment as a key paradigm in science is also something very important that we want to impart to the student. And therefore uh, the labs provide such an opportunity and which is why you build uh, lab journals, what was the objective? What did you do? What did you, what um, uh, you know, observations you did you make? What, how does that relate to the hypothesis that you started? So all that is because of this idea of experiment as a uh, key paradigm. Further, uh, when you when you perform an activity, okay, whether whether it is on the field or in the class or in a, in the lab, you have a better internalization of the content. And the quote that I have reproduced below must be something that uh, most of you are familiar with. Tell me, I will forget. Show me, I may remember. Involve me, I will understand. So the more you can involve the student into, into the learning process, the more he is able to connect, connect to the learning activity and the better, the deeper the learning and the longer it will stay in his, in his brain. Right? So that's, a, that's a, also the principle of active learning. So a laboratory based or practical based or a student involving uh, uh, activities help you to make the learning more effective in that process also. So when you when you actually allow, let the student, you know, take a weight and put it onto the spring and he can actually see the spring oscillating and coming to a stop, you have a better idea about, uh, you know, what Hooke's law is all about, right? As opposed to just, uh, you know, visualizing it in your mind when you talk in the class. So practically involving the student, that in, uh, letting the student be part of that learning process is one, one important achievement there. And these con uh, connecting the theory to the uh, real life. So that's why we want to make sure that uh, labs are active and labs are um, effectively used by students across uh, in, 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 in all these classes. But Many places you have cost and space requirements. You um, a physics lab or a chemistry lab for you know 40 students or 60 students means you need adequate amount of setup. You need all the infrastructure that is a spring or balance or weighing machines or a meter, voltmeter. All of that has to be procured and be kept operational and uh, space requirement for this. And similarly, if it is a chemistry uh, a lab that you talk about, uh, raw material cost is a significant concern. You need to have various types of acids. You need to have, you know, compounds, magnesium, sodium. Uh, storing them is dangerous sometimes. So, store appropriate storage facilities. So, there is a lot of running and um, uh, in uh, one-time cost involved in providing adequate lab um, uh, facilities to students. Now, with even then, even when you have schools have these facilities, we still provide limited access. You know, like. Thursday from three to four is physics lab. And that one hour is all you get in that week to, to actually work with a particular activity. Okay, so, um, and usually we do that in a group mode. 
all of that is for the same reason that you have limited resources and these are physical resources therefore you have to control the access and minimize the wastage associated with it right so these are challenges because uh, you the more time you can actually spend with that activity with the different combinations experimenting with this you actually learn better but we are unable to do it for these reasons further even if even if you had access to physical lab there are still restrictions on what you can do there like for example some if a student says you know how would the period of a pendulum uh, change if i were to take it to moon or to mars or to inside the um, you know the core of the earth there is no way you can actually demonstrate it you can only say that look uh, look at the g value the um, g value changes and you know it is in this equation and therefore it changes like that right so you can only do that much so um if it would be nice if you can actually kind of demonstrate uh, with the uth or pendulum that this is actually what happens another category of uh, these uh, these kind of activities is the dangerous reactions like for example burning of uh, sodium or uh, you know dealing with um, uh, very difficult acids like sulfuric acid or nitric acid these are all uh, um, you know dangerous things we have to be very careful watch um, uh, to be wa carefully watched and supervised and done there is another category also which makes it very challenging to look at a lab time taking task for example if you want to uh, show the life cycle of a mosquito it takes many days to for it to be completed right so you would not going to keep the lab till that period to do that or you want to you know show how let's say a fast reaction like a chemical reaction would uh, want um, uh, takes place it's so fast that you know within a within a second or something it's all over so and the student is not able to understand what is going on so these are also challenges you know would be nice to have some way to explain these things in a realistic way and that's where we want to bring in virtual labs one we uh, we may be able to avoid these problems of cost and space and limited access and all that and provide uh, you know essentially unlimited access to these resources second we may be able to uh, provide a mechanism to uh simulate uh, processes therefore we can do a lot of uh, things in the virtual lab than what we would have been able to do in the in the physical space and virtual labs is also one of the key recommendations of uh, nep 2020 so that is that's one reason why uh, uh, mr is also looking at this in a very serious way so virtual labs are basically what we are talking about are simulation labs so these are completely software labs so you just get onto the internet like collabs.edu.in website i gave you you need to go to into the internet you can actually access any of these labs and perform these experiments any number of times in middle of the night or day time or wherever you are right so that that is the power of uh, software driven uh, you know uh, th these labs but at the sa same time most of the labs retain the look and feel of the physical lab so when you when i show you a demo you will understand that so you you get unconstrained availability and very trivial cost so you can burn as much magnesium as you want without spending even one paisa right but why are we not using it that much because building these labs is a very expensive process because these are actually very complex software models and therefore building these things is not something like you know we can ask all the teachers or the various students to build it up they require professional uh, involvement and professional training and all that to be able to build these labs so which is which is what i'm going to come back to at the end and say well uh, these are not something that every teacher can actually build just like that well, when you want to create a lesson using word or we want to record a video this is something that today every teacher today can do with a mobile phone or you know by using a simple computer but a lab development is still a different ball game altogether and there are there are also um, uh, things that you need to keep in mind when you look at virtual labs because uh, there are you know for example if you look at uh, hooke's law uh, your theory says that uh, the linearity assumption that you make is valid only for a short region okay if you stretch it very very much or you compress it too much the the, the hooke's law may not hold so these are all some some of the things that sometimes simulations actually ignore we just assume that you seem infinitely linear 
uh, and there may be simplifications and things like that. But as I said, one of the advantages is that, uh, you know, for example, a nuclear reaction, which takes place in a fraction of a second, I can actually play it out over a, from, you know, uh, two or three minute long time scale. So I can just stretch the time. So you can, you have time to look at what happens at every, uh, every millisecond or microsecond or nanosecond in, in a reasonable amount of detail. Similarly, um, an activity which is very slow can be speeded up. I can compress the time and let the clock run faster. You can actually have a um, you know, mosquito you know, dropping the egg to um, you know, the, the live mosquito flying out within, within uh, maybe a minute or so. So this ability to manipulate <coughs> the time scale is one reason why we are all excited about virtual labs because it brings a lot of things into you teacher's hands which was, would not have been possible otherwise. And of course, as I said, you know, you can create a simulate the pendulum in moon or Jupiter by changing the parameters and the student could feel that this is how what actually it would look like there. And so all of this means that <clears throat> virtual labs can be a very powerful uh, instructional device. And we encourage all of you to use it if you haven't actually started, uh, you know, <clears throat> during the pandemic time. And, uh, <clears throat> Whatever is the subject that you are uh, teaching, we will have these labs coming coming for you in the in the months to come. But one thing that I want to um, emphasize here is that um, with all this uh, fancy part and nice uh, nice nice theory of uh, having a virtual lab, remember the physical lab experience is something unmatched. So uh, I mean, um, uh, the, when you go to a uh, chemistry lab, the smell of hydrogen sulfide and all that chemicals is something that gives you a feel which uh, when you can get onto your um, internet website and do a chemistry lab, you will not get it, right? So similarly, uh, the um, uh, heat of uh, the, the acid or the therm reaction that take place, also we cannot give you on a virtual lab. So we can give you the look and feel, the timelines, and the overall behavior, but there are aspects that is going to be missed. So it is very important that you still focus on using the physical lab as much as possible, augment it with the virtual labs. And therefore I, I would say virtual labs should be your amplifiers and not replacements of the uh, virtual labs, um, the um, physical lab. Okay, now if you want to use virtual labs in a classroom or in any in a, um, instructional context, um, I, I think I some chat messages are there. I will I'll take one uh, one more minute to complete this and I will answer those questions if they are there. Okay, so uh, provide a comprehensive ecosystem. So for example, you, you can go to the internet and find a lot of simulations and all that on various topics. They may be created by various people and it is available. But you cannot directly use them in your class because, you know, that simulator uses one kind of language, one kind of jargons, which may not be what you do. The process that they follow is possibly not what you are trying to do in your, uh, in your class. So having a comprehensive ecosystem to reduce time to use is very important. Okay, and the, the system should understand the pedagogical aspects and adopt the relevant usage pattern. Okay, and provide rich set of affordances and guidances and integrate into the curriculum. And the, the labs that we are providing to you actually meet all of them and they are all free, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a great resource from all that point of view. So we have um, um, uh, integrated uh, short notes on the theory that is relevant to the lab, okay, from your textbooks, etc. So right on the web website itself, you can get access to the basic material, the formula that is used and all of that. Understanding the process and its implications, auxiliary requirements, suppose, you know, let's say things like Hooke's law and you have to plot the graph, you have to record the readings of the various weights on a, on a table and use that to plot a graph. What we have done is even that is provided online to you. So as you measure the readings for different weights by putting a scale, you get the value, you can enter them into a table. And once a table is completed, you can plot and you can actually plot a graph with the values that you got. So that entire process, we have brought it online so that, uh, you know, you don't have to depend on any other additional resources and copying information and all that is not required. And we have also added a few review questions and references. So overall, uh, the lab is something that is perfectly integrated for you to 
uh, start using it. So this is a screenshot from uh, uh, a lab on Ohm's law and resistance. One of the things you see that, uh, you know, particularly in physics and chemistry, we have made these, uh, you know, uh, these instruments look as real as what would happen in a physical lab. So when you go there, when you, when you are exposed to this virtual lab, and then you go to the physical lab, you don't feel very disconnected. It is not an um, abstract uh, voltmeter. It is a real voltmeter that you are actually seeing. And uh, so, as I said, there is a theory tab, procedure tab, animation, uh, video, viva, resources, all of that are provided to you. And of course, there is always a feedback link for you to tell us if you didn't like something, if you have wanted to, or wanted to have some additional features and things like that. And this is a very interesting part of our virtual lab. As I said, you know, appropriate affordances for the lab. So when you want to do Ohm's law, what are the what are the parameters that you want to vary? You might want to change the you know material with which that wire is made. Okay, you want to see whether you know aluminium is more uh, conducting than uh, let's say copper. You want to change the length of the wire. You want to change the diameter of the wire. You want to change move the uh, resistance, the built-in resistance in the circuit. So all of these have been provided externally as an affordance you can manipulate. So you can change this knob, uh, this um, uh, knob which is currently on 10, you can drag it and set it to whatever value you want. And that's the value that the system will take when you run the simulator, okay? so. You, it, it is like you know uh, going and taking a different wire <clears throat> and then conducting the experiment. So every lab has a predefined set of uh, affordances like this, which has been provided to you, which is usually adequate for the purpose of the lab. Okay, we have a quick look at, um, I think most of the comments are, uh, okay, so there are no questions uh, so far. So I think uh, let me continue. Okay, so this is this is how the labs are structured, and uh, the lab side is coming up will also be essentially in that form. Okay, so OLABS is ready to use because compared to the many simulations available online, OLABS will provide a complete ecosystem for the lab, which is where this uh, the teachers can directly start using it. It has consistency in terminology across the labs, across the all the uh, tabs and labs. So you can, uh, you don't get uh, too many different uh, jargons to, um, you know, uh, to translate into each other. And uh, all the labs are compliant with the NCRT curriculum. So the NCRT CBSE teachers have actually vetted the, all the labs. So they perform and we have actually followed the, um, uh, the steps that is recommended in your uh, textbook. And therefore you again, don't see any disconnect between what is written in the textbook and what you're going to do online. Of course, some, some steps cannot be done the way it is written in the textbook. So we have adapted it, but by and large, following the spirit of um, the textbook and this thing, right? The, the most important part in, um, uh, in virtual labs is the high degree of interactivity. So it is not like watching a video, right? You have to, you have to, that is the student has to do activity at every step whether it is to clicking the burner, Bunsen burner to make it to come to life or pouring an acid into the beaker and then put, um, dragging it to and putting it on the burner and all that, every step, the activity has to be performed just as he would do in the physical lab. Okay, so this interactivity is very important. And so, so similarly, the feedback. So what is uh, what are incompatible or un, uh, not, um, uh, you know, uh, incorrect activities? will not be accepted by the system. So you also know that this is not what you should be doing. Okay, so this, these are uh, some of the great things with respect to the, uh, the labs that we are making available for you. And uh, now the, first, uh, the next question is, how do we actually make use of these labs? So again, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, most many of you know how to do it, but still let me, for the completeness sake, let me uh, uh, repeat that. So one uh, use case is to use these virtual lab before the students go to the physical lab. So you actually log into uh, all labs, perform the experiment in front of the class. If you have a smart class or something, you can project it for everybody or the student can do it at uh, their own uh, you know, uh, convenience also. So you go to the lab, uh, read the instructions, perform the activities, observe, make the observations, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, one or two times, 
and then go to the physical lab. So the idea is that, like I remember when I went to, I used to go to a physics lab. You know, I don't. We don't even know what we are going to do there. We don't know what uh, what is to be found there. So we'll all go as I heard, and somebody will say, "No, take this, do this, do this, put that, and write this reading, and then get out of there." So by the time when you you complete it, you are completely hazed because you have no idea what was what what was supposed to be done. What are the different things that we saw? There was no time to sit and reflect on it. With the virtual labs, you have all the time. So perform that activity in the class. uh or using uh, um, your uh, smart projection or whatever and explain to the student so he builds a model of what is to happen in the physical lab when he gets there so that the shock value is less and he will be able to actually concentrate on that similarly after the physical lab is over you can again expose the students to the virtual lab to reflect on what happened there so you can now repeat what you did in the physical lab see what is the result that you got ask two questions you know why it is like that or what would have happened or would have done so you can do all that reflective activities to deepen the understanding and if you could do only a part of the experiment there you can complete the rest of the experiment here so before and after are very good ways to augment your existing physical lab capabilities you can also use it as an instructional material so although hooks law is is given to you here as a lab you when you are teaching hooks law you can actually bring up the lab and uh, show that how the spring uh, varies uh, the length varies when you put different weights and what uh, law applies to them so you can actually uh, connect the uh, laboratory which is uh, you know physically you cannot bring a lab every time to the classroom to explain a concept right but virtual labs are available to you so you can bring these labs and uh, to open it up in the classroom perform these activities and you can even involve the student you can ask uh, you know okay at this point what would happen next or what should i do next right so ad adequate amount of instructional capabilities are also uh, possible with uh, with this virtual labs and uh, so same thing i would say for active learning so you can actually ask the student to perform an activity look at what he got and uh, ask the question why it is explain it or you can pause a lab at a particular point in time and ask the student to uh, student and say what would happen next what reading do i expect will the needle go this way or that way so all of that you can ask the student to visualize and um, based on his understanding if it is wrong you can then explain to him that this is see this is why you, you thought it like this but it actually happened like this right so for for active learning you can use uh, by um, uh, more involving the students as instructional material to make the concept clearer by actually demonstrating the the processes and before and after physical lab for amplifying the lab that you have okay so um, with that let me just take you to um, the uh, the olabs portal for from 5 minutes and i'll just quickly show you what capability we have there and um, then i'll come back and uh, take you to the re remaining part of uh, right okay yeah i want to share the all right online apps so um, so here uh, i will let me take you to the home page so this is olabs.edu.in the home page and as i showed you the um, the initial screen we started with physics chemistry biology maths and english but uh, recently we have started adding science computer social science languages and all that so the tabs are also grown up so let me take you something very easy for you to understand um let's say i'll take you an english lab it's something that you might be interested in looking at so english lab is basically a set of activities to understand to repeatedly try out um, you know some process to till you are mas mastering it so let's say passive to active voice or active to passive voice conversion i will take so again you can see theory procedure lab by bar references etc let me go directly to the lab you don't have too much time so in this lab the id what you can enter anything that you like okay 
so what happens in this lab is of course you know when you say english lab it might not sound like a physics lab when there are all these equipments and all that to do but a lab if we are interpreting it to mean a place where i can practice an activity multiple times till i get a hang of hang of it right so this is an activity to come convert active voice to passive voice so you can select which tense you want to try so uh, you can choose any of them let's say continuous past tense okay so what happens is when you select a tense the system generates a sentence in that tense for you alex was playing carrom okay so this is a sentence that is given to you and you have to convert it into passive voice now again what we have done we instead of typing in the passive voice and you know potentially making spelling mistakes and you know uh, and all that we have actually given you all the words jumbled out okay now you have to reorganize them in such a way that it becomes a proper passive voice so um i i am going to say alex uh, played uh, by okay so something like being okay well, let me put it like that okay alex was being played by karen okay so that's what i how i thought i think that is the um, uh, passive voice so i say submit so immediately the feedback comes he says subject is incorrectly placed and object is incorrectly placed so i come now you know it's not telling me anything about verb which means my verb is uh, correct my have to look at our subject and object so i realize that okay you know alex has to go to the end and uh, karam has to come to the beginning okay now again i click submit and he says your answer is right so this is this is how the the english labs work let me take you to maybe one subject lab uh, let's say physics okay so here you can see the ohms law and uh, i'll take something that is uh, a little easier to uh, demonstrate uh, okay so this is a uh, uh, i think this is okay okay so this is concave mirror focal length by uv method okay so here is the lab that you can see on the screen you can see the affordances here okay i can put the light on you can see the light light comes and falls on the mirror and reflects uh, all around and also falls on the screen i can put the light off the distance between mirror and object right the uh, the mirror and the object this distance i can control so you can see if i move it you can see that value is changing okay and you can also see on the top there is a scale there so because you will have to measure what is this distance from the mirror and the object you might find it a little hard to look at measure it from the scale that is given on the table so we have given you a magnified version of that scale on the top so you can see that the yellow arrow is actually pointing to 120 there so this is 120 and uh, this one you can again move it there and find out um, uh, what is the value there right similarly distance between mirror and screen so that also you can now change it and put it wherever you want and see what happens there okay so i'm going to keep it as it is now i put the light on and i should move this um yeah so i can move this mirror until at some point in time i should get this i think is not movable uh let me move this okay so at some point in time i yeah, you can see somewhere i am actually getting the image there right so that's a focal length right so you can see uh, a dot is forming if you have a little more patience you adjust them you can get a perfect dot uh, with a focal length right so if you move the um, um, object a little bit away that image is gone so now you can not get right so this that exact point you will actually get it okay so and when you get it you can actually see the um, uh, uh, the points marked by um, those arrows there use the scale on top precise values you can get substitute into the formula and you will actually get uh, the uh, the experiment completed right and again you can see theory procedure animation all that details are there 
so i um, i won't go into all the subjects uh, we don't have time and uh, you know please please try this out on um, on your own well, uh, for now let me get back to um, uh, the session okay so i'm going to go back to my open board okay so you got a sense of how virtual labs are um, arranged for you and under the diksha or the labs portal and how you can actually make use of it in your classroom right so right so as i mentioned in each lab we have provided you a set of affordances okay so you saw that uh, you know in the case of a simple pendulum it may be the wire length the value of g material of bulb so these are all carefully chosen based on the lab requirements and provided to you online so these are uh, and for tens conversion you may be able to choose that source and target tens and we also provide you a list of words to minimize uh, unnecessary typing overhead and errors that may be caused to that we have tables to record data where there are multiple uh, iterations of the uh, experiment is required plotting is provided wherever uh, that is required you get a graph paper and the plotted uh, curve actually automatically appears once the values are filled in and um, yeah and also some cases where you know uh, for example to connect a point to another point uh, in order to actually click exactly that point and build the connect might be a little difficult so we sometimes said just click there and the wire will automatically connect but that's more of convenience so that uh, you know uh, the uh, controlling the mouse very tightly might be a uh, might be a challenge so it's a, it's an uh, this thing that so these are all things that has been added to the core simulator in order to make the lab meaningful and uh, uh, you know usable by you. right okay so uh having um, um if you have uh, um, can relate to what i have said so far you will you can look at the virtual labs versus other content like playing a video or uh, using a textbook or even uh, drawing a picture how does virtual labs contain um, um compare with uh, other kind of content so virtual labs are usually highly interactive content so if there is no interactivity then it cannot be a lab at all because in all you cannot have a lab where the student is just going to sit and watch uh, something that's happening there right so and these uh, these are usable at an individual level so virtual labs usually are performed by somebody okay it can be a group where somebody takes turns so but there will be a representative person who actually performs the lab the content needs to be positioned so the teacher has to uh, indicate at what point in time this lab actually comes into existence so if there is a hooks law lab you ask you cover that uh, hooks law subject in the class you can connect to the uh, related to the lab so linking of the 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 labs will need to be linked with the content that actually is relevant to uh, the lab okay so at the core uh, the um, virtual labs are software programs uh, that i mentioned before reacting to user inputs and in interventions and uh, so these are also usable for active learning uh, pedagogy compared to uh, passive resources like a video or a te uh, textbook now uh, so one of the uh, so objectives as i said was to kind of uh, help you build such labs uh, wherever possible okay so building a lab means you know the what, what the core part that you want to build is the simulator so like for example if you saw that um, yeah, the um, a con a concave mirror which reflects light and you know and it focuses at a particular point as the mirror moves i have to recalculate or um, to figure out where uh, the focal length is and if it is not at the place where the screen is put then i should i should not show the image because you don't you will get a very blurred image so you can either show a blurred image or as the perfect position comes you should get a very sharp image put input up there all of this is actually what the software does the so the computer program actually adjusts this based on this calculation so using the um, uh, the distance from object to the mirror and mirror to the screen the um, the equations are calculated and uh, the uh, the quality of the uh, image is determined right so there is full uh, software modeling similarly when you do a pendulum 
you are actually uh, capturing the equation of the pendulum and using that to calculate how much it will swing and what speed it will swing and all that, all that kind of details, right? Similarly, maths lab means that all the applicable maths rules have to be followed. So even if I do a partial multiplication, you, uh, the rules, whatever is applicable at that point must be correctly followed. So the simulator, which is a software program, is the core of the implementing a virtual lab. So, uh, and in addition to the simulator, we need to build all that ecosystem, as I said, you know, the theory, the reference material, instructions, help and feedback, additional reference material, review questions. But this is not very critical in the sense they are basically a text material, which I'm sure you are able to build them. So, simple text editor is sufficient to build this. Now, let's, uh, for example, um, uh, what, I, what I mentioned earlier, if you have a pendulum, so this is how the pendulum is uh, de depicted in the in uh, in the virtual lab. You will actually capture the force and as the pendulum moves up, the direction of the force uh, will change with respect to the um, uh, the blob of the pendulum, the angle, and therefore you know how much of g will be applied in which direction. And uh, so similarly, if you take a mass problem, so here is uh, 1027 plus 999. And the student has answered a part of the step. So he has actually done 9 plus 7, got 6, and the carry is put there. So I have to capture all of this so I can tell him if this is not 1, I don't tell him. So I think, Baba, you have not put the carry properly or you haven't understood the concept of carry. Right? So capturing all these level of detail is very important for me to know what is it that the student is doing so that I can give him appropriate feedback. Okay, so that that so that is how that is the challenge of modeling or building a simulator in in detail. I'll show you a little simulator that uh, I have implemented using one of the tools which I will show you. Okay, so you can experiment with it if you really want to play around and you know build some simple labs for your uh, requirements. I think you should be able to manage time. Okay, so building the simulator uh, itself has additional uh, challenges. You have to decide the affordances. What are the parameters which you want to allow the user to change? So whether material, length, radius, and all of that, whatever is applicable for that lab, you have to decide. Because these parameters have to be modeled into the equation that you're using for simulation. OK, so if I'm going to fix the pendulum with a standard blob and the standard length, and only G is going to be changed, then I need, really need an equation only with the G as parameter, but everything is already known, right? But if I want the length also to be uh, brought as a parameter, then I have to capture that also in the equation. So that decides the complexity of the simulation that you will need to build. Identify and design the components. Now, as you saw the ammeter, how it should look. You can have, you know, for example, you can just draw a box like this, and put a blob and you know just have a you know a digital reading and you can say this is an ammeter and that's okay right for you if your requirement is only that much that is fine so in the physics and chemistry lab you can see that mostly the look and feel is like seeing a real ammeter or voltmeter so the student can actually connect better if you're just doing it for the purpose of a demonstration or something even an abstract depiction like this is also quite all right Design the sequence of steps required. So how should the lab be performed? What is the first step? What are the second step? Are the steps mandatory to be followed in that order? Or can you change? All of that logic also need to be understood, documented. Then the user intervention and feedback. So this is very important feedback because otherwise the lab would actually look um, thing. So it is like, uh, you know, if you take, um, uh, if, you, if you put uh, some water to boil, and you boil it for uh, 10 hours, you will actually, the whole thing will start melting, right? So if you don't give feedback, the student will think that, you know, you can keep the water to boil for 10 hours without any break, right? So appropriate feedback at each stage so that uh, the student understands what is to be done, when he has to stop, what he should do, what he is doing wrong, all of that should be captured in. And also keep in mind any hot spots. What are the common areas where students have a problem? That should be captured in and brought into it so that in the process of uh, performing the lab activity, all that concepts also get improved. So desired user measurements, observations, and support needed for it. What are the, whether 
whether I should provide a scale. So like the example I showed you, there was a physical scale, which is exactly matching with the, the real scale. Okay, the, you know, in one of the labs, uh, we have actually built a protractor. So you can actually turn the protractor and put it along the line and see what uh, angle the other line is actually subtracting. So if you say that, you know, for example, uh, you know, certain uh, lines, uh, tangents uh, intersect at a um, 90 degree angle, you should be able to verify that it is, yes, it is actually at a 90 degree angle. Some cases you need clock. And so that, that on. so these are all additional and, uh, you know, uh, mechanism that you will provide to the virtual lab environment so that the environment is complicated. So remember that you cannot use your watch to time an activity that happens virtually because the virtual time is different from your physical time, right? Similarly, you cannot use your uh, physical scale and then use that to measure the uh, you know distance on the screen because you can zoom and the scale goes for a toss. Right? So you need the uh, virtual versions of the scale, the protractor, the clock, all of that in order to complete the uh, simulator effectively. Okay, so once you have done all this, you understand what the simulation is to do, what is the formula required, what are the parameters that is required, affordances, sequence of steps, all of that, you can then worry about building the simulator. Okay, so uh, as, I, as, as you can guess, it's a fairly complex process. There is a lot of things. So, but if any of you are good with computer programming or has an inclination to do something like that, yeah, I would suggest that you try it. Okay. Now, as a kind of wire media, I can suggest a tool called a Scratch. Okay. Again, some of you may be familiar with it. If not, it is it's a good thing to try and play with it. I will show you how Scratch looks like and what how to use it. And I will show you one lab, one um, a lab activity that I've created using Scratch for you so that you understand how uh, what, what all these things that I've been talking about so far. Okay, so both the GeoGebra and Scratch, the good thing is that you don't have to write program like you would do it in Python or Java, you know, all the syntax and uh, to put a comma, semicolon and all that, you don't have to worry about it because they are visual programming mechanisms. Okay, so, yeah, so, uh, oh, yeah, okay, no, not too many questions, good. Okay, so they are visual programming mechanisms, so I'll show you what it means, that you will actually, you can see what you are trying to do, and even if you do something wrong, nothing much, nothing bad will happen. The system is actually to tolerate it, it will tell, give you a feedback, so you will, you will not burn, uh, you know, kind of spoil your computer by playing a lab like this. Okay, so that's not a... <clears throat> okay, so both allow experimenting visually to support tinkering and gradual refinement. So again, you don't have to go with the full plan, just fiddle with it, play around with it. You can slowly, slowly build build up uh, these these labs as, as you become uh, comfortable. All primitives are predefined, so you cannot, you may be restricted in terms of some functionality, but that is how it builds a visual support for you. And uh, in return, you get very good feedback with uh, these systems. Okay, now uh, let me take you to, um, no, I think I'll, let me give you this intro and then I will take you to uh, scratch while we look at it and then we'll come back. Okay, so. Um, now the the scratch mode. Let me show you. Okay, so this is this is a scratch screen. I've taken a screenshot. Uh, okay, so you might this might look very confusing. Let me start at the right place. Look at this part, the bottom right part. Okay, there are some two interesting things there. There is something called a stage, and there is something called a sprite. Okay, so a a scratch program is basically bringing a lot of sprites onto a stage, asking them to do something and go away. So it's kind of like a drama, right? So in a drama, you have a stage, it's a theater. Okay, and then you have these various characters who comes and perform something and then goes away. Somebody comes, gives a dialogue and then goes away. Somebody comes, does a dance and goes away, whatever, right? So sprites are your characters and stage is your, um, the drama stage, right? And uh, what does uh, making a program mean? You have to tell the uh, characters when to come to the screen and what you should, what that character should do and how to 
well, how it should go back. Okay, so that is what the sprite programming is about. So the fundamental point is to understand that I need a stage on which the, my uh, program will run and I need uh, one, two, three, ten, hundred, whatever number of sprites. Okay, these are my characters. Okay, so with that, let me go back to my intro. So sprites are the characters which are alive on the screen. Okay, so these are the ones who actually play the drama. So on my uh, screen here, I have three sprites, um, purple, red, and uh, you know, kind of whitish uh, uh, characters. Okay, all other aspects can be put in the background image. So for example, if you want a house or a school or um, you know, um, um, a study room or whatever, all of that can be thought of as background. So when I actually show you the sprite, I mean the scratch demo, I'll show you where to get all these things and what you can do with that. Now, one more thing that you need is uh, what is the concept of a costume. So, uh, as I said, Scratch is a very simple uh, two-dimensional uh, view of programming. So, even your stage is basically just two-dimensional, right? Of course, there is, the, there is a Scratch 3D which people are talking about, but let's keep it to a simple one. Now, uh, so if I create uh, this face, uh, you know, which is an um, uh, oval uh, face, which is a happy face, and he does something or he tries to solve a problem, he doesn't get it, he becomes sad. Okay, now, how do I make, show him in a sad form? So what happens is every sprite, I can define one or more costumes. Costume is not just the dress, it is the look and feel of that sprite. So I can make uh, the same oval, a uh, sad face, a happy face, an angry face, and maybe a uh, you know, bloated face or whatever. So I can have one or more costumes for every sprite. Okay. And the program allows me to change costumes. So when, when a problem is presented by, you know, let's say this fellow, and I don't get to um, answer it correctly, the, uh, the sprite can actually change it into an angry mode. Okay, so sprites can change costumes in order to reflect what is going on. Pretty much like what happens in a, theater, in a, in a drama theater, right? So characters come and they do something, they go, they change the costume. Usually there too, they change the costume when they leave the um, thing and come back, come back in a new costume. But we, have, we are much, much more sophisticated. We can actually change the costume right on the stage. Okay, if you have defined your background, that is your stage and the sprites and the costumes, all you need to do is to tell the sprite what to do. So write a program for each sprite. Here now the sprites can talk, it can take input, it can move, it can change color, it can change costume, it can perform calculations, a lot of things have been provided to you. And uh, they can also talk to each other by sending messages, okay? So that is what you see on this left side, there is a lot of code, like for example, move 10 steps or uh, is, is one block. Okay, so you can just drag and drop here and then that sprite will actually move 10 steps. You can turn 15 degrees, go to some random position and glide, point, change the direction. So there is a lot of uh, these primitives are given to you, okay, to actually perform the action. Okay, I'll show you what the, some actual code and how, what it works there in, uh, in, in another minute. Okay, so, uh, and these uh, numbers that you see inside uh, in this white box are changeable. So if you don't want to do 10 steps, you want to do one step at a time, that's fine. You just change the value there and uh, it, that is perfectly fine. Another thing to notice is this uh, shape of these, um, you know, pieces that shows what pieces can follow each other. So that's a kind of syntax check for you. So automatically you know that, um, you know, uh, certain shapes don't go along. So you know that, that that is not valid. Okay, so yeah, so this is a good time to let me go back to my web screen and uh, I'll show you. Okay, so again, you are back to your scratch screen. Okay, but this time it is a live scratch screen. Okay, so this is the URL, scratch.mit.edu. This project also is available online. So you can access it and play, modify it, play around with it, all that is fine. Okay, so this, this lab, what I have done is to, is uh, I want to, 
uh, the experiment which I showed you. I wanted to show uh, the focal length of a uh, con uh, convex lens. Okay, a convex lens. I want to determine the focal length. What do you do for that? Well, you have uh, light coming through the lens and uh, it will converge at some point. So if I put a screen at the place where uh, the focal length comes, you should get a sharp image of whatever is uh, it's coming from outside. Right. So that's that's uh, that's basically what it does. So that's what I have tried to uh, emulate here. But you can see that some challenges, you know, uh, building too much sophistication will be very hard. So as I mentioned earlier, I need a stage, right? So here is my stage. So I've actually done. So this is the stage that I have actually created. Okay. The stage is built in. You have a lot of stages available in uh, Scratch. You can pick it up. What I've added is that the lens that I'm going to use uh, for the experiment, that is not going to change, right? So you're going to fix the length and move the screen and uh, capture the image. So I have decided that this lens and um, you know the, the, the line on which you are going to do this experiment, uh, I have added that also to the stage. So I don't have to uh, worry about them separately. Okay. Now I also created some simple uh, program to it, but that is not something very critical. So I, it is just to initialize all the pieces. Now, if you come, come to the bottom right, uh, extreme bottom, there is something called to choose a backdrop. I can go here and uh, choose a backdrop. You can see this, and lots of backdrops are available. You know, school, urban, space, uh, spaceship, room, blah blah blah, all of that. You can choose any of these, okay, for a backdrop for you, right? Further, you can you can draw a picture, okay, if you are good with it, you can draw a picture take a photograph and upload it. So you can create your own backdrop also very comfortably. So all that is possible. So you can choose one, you can paint one your own, you can uh, pick a random one or you can upload a backdrop. So you have got your state set. Second thing I said is that we need a sprite, one or more sprites. So in this case, uh, if you see the, the lens, and uh, the light is coming from here and it will uh, form an image on the this. So I need some place to capture that image. So the only thing that I need in my experiment here is a screen. So this purple thing that you see on the screen, on the stage is that screen. Okay, That is my rendition of it. So I'm going to click on this uh, purple screen and um, you can see this is actually that image of uh, the purple screen with a cross in it. Why cross? Because what I've done is that instead of uh, you know trying to depict the image of the uh, object, I, um, I will um, uh, put a cross to say that the image is not good enough. It's not sharp enough. And when it becomes uh, perfectly on the focal length, I will change the costume to this. It's a tick mark, which means, yes, the, you are at the focal length. So I have a sprite, only one sprite, which by default is a cross. And when it is at the right position, it will turn to a tick mark. And the student knows that, okay, yes, I got, I got it at the right place. So uh, this must be the focal length. Okay. So this is, this is basically how my experiment is uh, created. You can uh, ex explore all of these. These are places where I can change the look and feel. I can change the shape. I basically, I can just draw any picture I want. Okay, there is no, no restriction. There is a uh, painter basically available here. But I'm going to uh, again skip that part and go to the code segment. But, uh, now let me show you how it runs. Okay, so I uh, to um, uh, the way usually uh, scratch programs run is to, to get a control. We always start saying when the flag is clicked. Okay, so look at this one. When green flag is clicked. And that's available to you as a, uh, you know, option in there. So here, when green flag is clicked, this available as one button. So you can pick that. You can see that on top of the, you cannot attach anything else. It is a, it, that's the beginning code. So when a flag is clicked, I set my size. I go to some particular position. I change the costume to wrong. And I say, give some message, and then I'll do something. So let me run it. So I click green. 
So you, uh, you can see it gives me a message saying that move me left and right till the cross turns. I have also given you on the screen the current exposition. The focal value is 64 and currently I'm at 30. Okay. So when I move this uh, to left or right, so you see not yet because my distance is becoming lower and lower. So now I'm going to increase it. Increase, increase. Yes. Okay, I reached the 65, the FLU 64. I built some little bit of tolerance. Okay, so it's congratulations. The distance length is the approximate focal length. If I keep moving to the right, it says, sorry, that is uh, too much, right? So it is not the focal length. So you can keep moving. And when you are at the focal length, it will change to a tick mark. This is good. This is good enough for a simple lab activity. And this code here, what you can see, this colorful code is basically doing that. So it says forever, wait until a key is pressed. Okay, so if you press a left arrow, in, decrement the position by um, five. If you press the right arrow, increment it five. If you have reached the uh, in desired position, then change the costume to the right. That is the tick voila. Otherwise, switch the costume to wrong. That's all that is then the code. So you can, when you read it, you can kind of make sense out of it. Play around with it a little bit, you will understand it. So you can go onto the site and play around with it, look at the code, make a copy of it, adapt it, all that you can, you have perfectly uh, do for this purpose, right? So this is actually what the scratch environment does. So it's a pretty simple environment. So um, uh, the normal process is to build a stage, define some sprites, attach programs to this and all programs start with saying when flag is clicked so that uh, when every time you click all sprites will come back to some default position and start from there right and all the code blocks are here so you can see some motion blocks for moving there are looks block which says uh, say switch costume chain size and all that there are sound blocks you can record your own sound for example if you want to say wow fantastic or something like that you can record it and play it back through this mechanism. So sound options are there, event options are there. You can detect when I'm touching a wall, when I'm touching another object, all these are built in for you. There are control blocks so like wait, if then, and things like that. And sensing blocks, if you are touching the mouse pointer, if you are touching the border, all that you can do. There are also standard operators, plus minus, greater than, less than, and all that, variables and my blocks. Okay, that's it. So that's that's a kind of primitives available. And how you program is by dragging and dropping it onto the screen. And it becomes part of the uh, program uh, for that particular sprite. So you click on a sprite, you go to the code and create your program. Add one more sprite, you can go like a backdrop. You have also have a lot of different sprites. Available. So you can see animals, butterflies, prune, maple, and all that are available. So you can actually pick. So I'm going to, I've added an Apple Sprite, for example, now, right? So you can now define its property and the code and all that. Okay, so I'm not going to get into too much detail. I'll uh, answer if you have some questions, but let me wrap up my presentation and then uh, we can uh, take your questions or whatever. But I don't think anybody has any questions. Maybe you're all bored or you don't understand, you're not following this, but anyway. So going further, uh, we are going to look at the uh, expanding the capabilities quite a lot. We want to build in evaluation capabilities, proper and timely guidance. If the student is alone now in the lab uh, and he's doing wrong, I mean, we need to make sure that you have appropriate feedback. We want to build in collaboration. So even two students, maybe somebody from Meghalaya and somebody from Tamil Nadu can actually work together online and uh, perform the experiment. So be nice. Right, uh, we're building an immersive experience. Right now, some places you have a good look and feel um, uh, uh, comforted there. Some places it is more abstract, but um, we want to try and build more immersive activities. So augmented reality, virtual reality, all that technologies we are going to look at. We're also trying to build in some amount of gamification or game points. So very, everything that you do correctly will earn you some points, some badges, and therefore, you know, you can, you it creates some excitement about it. And uh, labs for non-science subjects, including uh, social science, um, languages, uh, maths, all of these subjects are being uh, explored for building labs. 
So these are all being explored in the labs that are coming up. Uh, so many of these, let me let me kind of skip this. Uh, if you have questions, I'll take it at the time. Yeah, so for example, we want to, you know, instead of mouse becoming the only control point, can we make more realistic manipulators? For example, can I uh, give a gesture, you know, do something like that? It should move and move left, move right, or light it up or open it. So all of this I can do by gesture. It will be easier so that, uh, you know, uh, mouse doesn't become a single point of control. Even speech operations, so I can actually tell to open and close, that's also possible. Haptic devices, which allows uh, pressure sensing. Okay, so these are all some of the things that we are exploring to build in, in the labs that, uh, that are coming up. Okay, so all this I talked about. So, um, so uh, with that, I mean, we will come to the end. So we have got a sim. I've been trying to give you a feel of what these labs are, what can you do with them, and why so they are so complicated to build, and how uh, you could try building if you want to experiment with it. So even if building a lab is complex, there are many ways you can help in this activity because your help is very important in uh, making this activity because region-wise, uh, local-wise, there may be variations in uh, how students relate to a subject their challenges in uh, linking and all that. So share ideas where a lab activity would be appropriate beyond the listed labs and we would be uh, very keen to listen to you and incorporate these labs also in, in, uh, in, in the days to come. Share areas of difficulty commonly felt. So when a, uh, a lab activity is being performed, there may be some places where students are stuck or they don't understand. Tell us what those places are so we can build in additional affordances or um, additional feedback mechanism to make that uh, more more uh, intuitive share common misconceptions and challenges and also review the lab and tell us uh, what is wrong how what what is not working or what can be improved so that way you know we can make the lab uh, better and even the language feedback explanations anything you think uh, can be made better Maybe from your regional requirement perspective or even from across. And that would be good because then we can go back and refine these uh, to make them more, more comfortable for you. We are, we are very keen that uh, these resources become uh, valuable for you. And as we, we, are con we feel convinced that these are, these are very precious resources uh, to improve the teaching learning process. So thank you. And if you have any questions, um, I'll take that. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, move over to CIT. Okay, I think there are. Okay, language lab, I only give you an example um, from uh, active voice to passive voice conversion. I shall definitely be able to run a virtual lab for students on a lab, but I think creating one of my own be a challenging task. Uh, yeah. But yes, try it. If you feel that uh, you want to try it, you should try it. And I think Scratch is a good place for you to, um, uh, you know, experiment with it. Okay. Anyone else? Um, any any questions or anything that you want to share? Please go ahead. I think we have another five minutes or so. Today, managed to squeeze squeeze a little bit of time. Yeah. So dear participants, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or you can post them in the chat box. We'll take it up from there. Okay, I think you're all being good students, not asking questions. Okay, but you know, anyway, I mean, I've given you my email address and all that. So do write in case you have any anything that you want to share with us. You can share right to, uh, so it can be shown only in the smart classroom. Uh, no, uh, Kiranjit, you can, I mean, the smart classroom is one way of doing it. Like, for example, um, if you, uh, if when, I, when I'm actually want to project this to the whole class, and I, I will perform something on virtually online, but I want the whole class to see it, you can project it onto a screen and then all the class can do. But otherwise, what we would want to do is for every student to be able to do individually. They can use your uh, tablet or desktop or whatever uh, there, or they can go home and access these devices from uh, whatever facilities are available. 
if the school has a computer lab they can go and do that also there so uh, anyways we want this to be individual oriented not uh, i mean the teachers presence or guidance is important but uh, we we don't i mean we want it to be individual oriented when it comes to that uh, cwsn is what is cwsn uh, children with special needs Ah, okay, okay. I'm the the um, differently abled and all that. Yeah, yes, that sir. is something that we are also concerned. We are trying to see what is the best we can do. Of course, for uh, you know visually challenged and all that, we can give uh, oral um, audio instructions. But uh, for other categories uh, where we want them to actually perform the act um, activity, we are uh, we are we do, I don't have a, a concrete solution to it. But I'm I'm concerned. We are we are uh, seriously thinking about what we can do about it. email address i will share it again in the chat box you can take it from there so sidag.in is my um, formal official email address and i also have a gmail address which i think you will find it easier to remember and uh, so you can write to either of these so dear participants any other feedback comments or questions that you may have can raise your hand or post them in the chat box so i don't think there are any more yeah. questions sir yeah. Yeah. so uh, we can close the session but before that dear participants there is a short quiz that we have for you i will be posting the link in the chat box shortly the link will be open till 6 pm we'll be accepting responses only till 6 pm okay i think there is one comment uh, in the chat box by providing only audio effects for visually challenged challenged child will not yes. be appropriate okay we know that so we understand that uh, which, i mean audio is not the only way to do but we have to see what works because the the providing an intervention to any of these challenged uh, students is a very complex process because we need to understand their mental model and uh, try to make sure that we are able to sync with it so people have been trying all kinds of things you know converting um, uh, what, this thing into a audio form even images into an audio form and trying to sense the sound waves so but we don't know when to what extent all of these works so you can uh, you know provide reading and one of the biggest challenges that uh, we are looking at is um, diagram accessibility for example so if i want even if i want to lay out the um, activity on the screen i want to tell this tell this person that uh, see this is what it looks like you know the spring is suspended here and this is what is there etc so uh, yes it is it's a huge challenge we really don't understand because Uh, i had recently posted something on linkedin on on this uh, aspect we are beginning to understand how to address uh, text and uh, you know text material so by providing uh, you know suitable text uh, audio alternative but beyond that we really don't know much to do you know an educational mm -hmm. game mm -hmm. yes. yes. so uh, dear participants i hope that answers the query of course everything uh, it has a scope for accommodating options for cwsn as well that's another work in progress however uh, we all believe that virtual labs actually provide the autonomy to the students in practicing performing and exploring the experiments in a cost effective as well as a time efficient manner and i think sir actually gave us a wonderful overview along with examples for you to understand and have a look at what's in store uh, for virtual labs on diksha and i would also encourage all the participants to explore virtual labs on diksha further to find out the different experiments simulations and activities that we have there so that you can also use it for your students and for their engagement in the classrooms so i would once again like to thank sasi kumar sir for his time and for giving us such a wonderful session on virtual labs thank you so much sir it was wonderful to have you here with us thank you thank you okay so i think you can continue i will i will log out yeah thank you bye right, sir take care sir